Hi, my name is Rebecca Cullardson, and I'm going to be talking to you about one of my favorite topics, thinking asynchronously, application integration patterns for microservices. Now, what I'm going to go through today isn't necessarily only for microservices, but I'm going to talk about it within the context. But why am I here today and who am I? Uh, I'm, as I said, Rebecca Kulidzan. I'm a solutions architect at Amazon Web Services, and I'm a serverless and event-driven architectures enthusiast. Uh, within Amazon Web Services, I sit in what we call our technical field community uh, of specialists in serverless and, and event-driven. Uh, alongside my career, I work as a mental health advocate, and I've formerly worked as a data engineer, policy consultant, and social media advisor, so I've work, worn many hats. Um, the agenda for today's talk uh, is fourfold. So I'll start with common serverless patterns. Uh, as I said, uh, the communication patterns and, and integration patterns for microservices aren't limited to uh, serverless architectures nor microservices themselves, uh, but I think it's a, a good place to start to understand why I'm talking about asynchronous and why I think you should be considering it for your applications. Then I'll go on to decoupling your application, uh, what I mean by that and some tools to do so, um, some common integration patterns, as I said, and finishing off with event-driven architecture uh, and how you can do that on AWS. So some common serverless uh, patterns. Uh, so most uh, customers that I speak to and that we speak to at AWS um, work in, start off their applications in this way. Um, so you'll have an API, uh, some compute component and some storage. Uh, this is typical in, in web applications, but many other applications too. Um, so within your API, you may have some security and, and routing components. Uh, storage obviously hosts your storage. And then everything else is kind of in the middle. Um, and so with these three components, uh, if something goes wrong, it's most probably going to go wrong in this place. Why, you may ask? Well, because it's my code. Um, many of us uh, are watching today and, and attending this conference are developers, have been developers, have built things, um, and we all know things go wrong. Certainly it does in my code, um, but it's not all up to human error. Writing less code means there's less to maintain, which means it's easier to run and makes more reliable and frankly more secure apps. So how can we improve on this? Well, as I said, I, I work in the serverless space and we're talking about serverless patterns. So maybe throwing it all into Lambda. Lambdas are state, stateless event-driven uh, functions that exist in the cloud or on AWS. But there aren't that many apps with only one function, one entry point, one module, one component. So there'll be lots more than just one function. In fact, it can be common to have loads, loads of them talking to each other all over the place. And many applications have some sort of data storage component, databases. Uh, in here, I've put DynamoDB, but you could use any uh, to replace this. Uh, and on the cloud, I noticed that a lot of them also have queues of one kind or another. This is probably more what your modern application looks like, particularly in serverless. <clears throat> but if this is what your app looks like, then you may have said these statements or asked yourself the following questions. How can I se sequence tasks? How can I run tasks in parallel? I want to try retry failed tasks or messages. Well, the first way to do this is decoupling your application. Two principles that are really important when designing systems is divide and conquer and the other loose coupling. Well, we're already dealing with microservices, as I said at the start of this talk, so you're probably already applying divide and conquer. Um, but when we're talking about coupling, what do we mean? Well, uh, I love this, this quote by Gregor Hope that says, the appropriate level of coupling depends of the level of control you have over the endpoints. In cases where you have more control, tight coupling might make more sense. But where you have less control as your app scales or, or you have more complex routing, loose coupling might be better for you. So when I talk about coupling, what do I mean? Well. Coupling is a measure of the independent variability between connected systems. It has a cost, both at design and runtime, and it isn't one dimensional. Um, and it's also not a single choice you'll make for your full architecture. Different methods work for different aspects of your architecture. And there's some things you should think about when thinking about coupling. That could be technology dependency, 
So Java versus C sharp could be location dependency, uh, data type dependency, semantic dependency, or what I'll be talking to more today, temporal dependency. So sync versus async. So thinking asynchronously. Well, when I'm speaking to customers, many reference, as I said at the beginning of the talk, that they're using APIs, usually REST APIs, on their radar for communication across their microservices, but not so many are mentioning asynchronous messaging. And when they talk about asynchronous messaging, um, we can have several advantages. Not just, it's not the solution for every scenario, as I said, and hopefully this talk will help you pick the right tool for the right job. So if you think about a traditional microservice and a request hits your application from the outside, it will have several other services within it to get fully processed. In a synchronous system, this could block several services or resources within a communication path as you wait for each subsequent completion from the initial request. If you have a problem downstream, this can easily accumulate upstream, particularly if upstream systems keep requesting while they wait for a response breaking your whole service or at least a significant part of it. Otherwise, some commands just take really long to respond. We've all been there clicking on a website, wondering why a form hasn't submitted and we don't have time to wait and neither do your customers. So to summarize, synchronous commands are when I ask you and you reply with your answer straight away. Asynchronous, you can think when you ask someone a question, I ask you a question, you sit there and you go, hmm, I've heard what you've got to say, but I'm going to come back to that later. Both have pros and cons. Um, synchronous systems are simple. They have low latency, less baggage as we're quite trying to communicate. They are simple to describe and troubleshoot. And the senders can fail fast. But there are disadvantages as your sender and receiver have to be working at all times. Throttling and bursts of traffic can can take down your system more easily, especially in a large system uh, when components come back online. Asynchronous events, however, can improve the responsiveness and reduce dependencies. They're more resilient to failures and they have things like queues as buffering mechanisms, which I'll talk to in a moment. This helps create architectures that can respond to unexpected events, uh, backlog recovery time, and create fairness in multi-tenant systems. Here's another kind of example of, of what I've shown earlier, but this uh, quote at the top, I want you to take through you to, with the rest of my presentation. If you don't need a response, execute asynchronously. Uh, and another quote from a former colleague, Tim Bray, if your application is cloud native, large scale or distributed and doesn't include a messaging component, that's probably a bug. Now I know he's being tongue in cheek here, but really, um, when decoupling your application or building applications at scale, it can be really helpful to include a messaging component and particularly when working with microservices. So the first integration pattern I'm going to talk to uh, is messaging exchange. Now, as a reminder, these are general use, not just for microservices, but I'm gonna discuss these in the context of microservices today. And the patterns that I'll be showing are a great tool for architects and technologists alike in general to talk about stuff. Uh, again, I work for AWS, so I'm going to be talking about it in the context of our services, uh, but hopefully these can be applicable to all types of applications. Um, so the first uh, messaging exchange I'm going to talk to is quite simple, a sender and receiver. Imme it immediately shows you the messages are decoupled. There's an expectation that there's no response, and you distinguish with messages intent, a command message perhaps, document message or transfer, event message or notification. The second is an asynchronous request response. The requester sends a request message and the responder on this message sends the message back to B, the requester. But when you're looking at this, you may have two questions. How can the responder request a response? And how can the responder assign an incoming response to a previous request? The first way to do this is a return address which is metadata injected into the message. And the second is a correlation ID, metadata, metadata into the request message with a unique identifier so that message, message B is taken to the right place. 
On the left-hand side is what we call an integration pattern. Uh, the, you integrate uh, sender with the responder and use the message channel for it. And the second is called a conversation pattern or a composite pattern. Now, there are different kinds of message channels for event stores, uh, buffering messages until services are available to process. And I wanted to talk through a couple more. The first is a point to point queue model. So you could have multiple senders, but in this example, I've, tried, I've kept it simple with just one. Um, each message from the queue is delivered to one consumer. Imagine there are too many messages for your consumer to consume, however. You could add these to a queue while you add more consumers to scale these requests. In this example, our queue acts as a kind of load balancer for your message or buffers your messages in peak loads. The second and a fundamental uh, model is the publisher subscribe or topic. Um, you may also have heard this as the fan out method. Publishers send messages into the topic and subscribers receive all that they are subscribed to, in this case, all of the messages. Imagine you turn on the radio in the morning before work. You're listening for an hour, your favorite songs and your favorite radio station. And then you go to work, you turn off your radio and you go about your day. Then when you come home, you switch on that radio. And again, you're listening to the, listening to the music that you love, tuning into your favorite DJs, but you've missed everything that's been going on in the middle of the day. That's how the pub sub model works and topics. There's no buffer. When every subscriber receives every message, what if it overwhelms the subscriber? You can't simply add another process to share the load. Now, there is a solution for this, the topic queue change pattern, which I don't have time to go into today, but essentially it combines these two approaches by adding a queue in between the topic model. If, if you'd like to learn more about this, uh, my colleague Dirk Freuner's talk from AWS reInvent is really great, and I can share that with those uh, in the chat or on socials afterwards. Um, AWS offers a number of uh, messaging and event sources which can help, uh, which can help uh, implement this functionality. Which one you select is driven by a number of factors, including if you're migrating an existing application or building a new one, and different uh, services have different properties. Uh, the first service I'd like to talk about is Amazon Simple Queue Service or SQS. It's our simple, flexible, and fully managed message queuing service for reliably and continuously exchanging any volume of messages from anywhere. Uh, we actually use this uh, at Amazon on, on Black Friday uh, and exchange billions of messages successfully. So really can be any volume of messages. Messages uh, are at least once delivery. You have a visibility timeout and they're useful for long polling and Lambda synchronous invocation. Amazon Simple Notification Service, or SNS, is our published subscribe messaging service. It has high throughput, it's highly reliable messaging delivery. Messages are published to a topic with multiple subscribers or fanning out, and messages can be filtered and only sent to certain subscribers. They also work well with asynchronous Lambda invocations. There are two other services which I don't have time to cover off today, uh, but are worth noting. Uh, we have Amazon MQ if you have specific software requirements. Uh, and if you're in the IoT space, AWS IoT Core for Messaging Broker. Uh, the next channel I'd like to talk about is the dead letter queue pattern. When I posted about this topic on social media for the first time and asked people what they wanted to hear on the topic, I was overwhelmed, overwhelmed with responses about dead letter queues. When talking to customers, it's a frequent question I get asked when we talk about messaging. How, what is a dead letter queue? How do I handle them safely? What's the purpose of them? Where do I need them and when do I not? So a dead letter queue allows customers to store messages that applications cannot successfully consume. Imagine a producer sends a message to another consumer. The consumer is processing message C and receives an exception. It, re it receives it again repeatedly. You don't want to continue with this. So you take this message offline. It could be a sign of a transient failure or maybe a po poison pill. That doesn't necessarily mean it's malicious, but just a message that always runs into an exception. So the dead letter queue deals with this. You can instruct, instruct that after X times of trying, you put this into the dead letter queue for later inspection. 
The number at which you choose is up to you, um, but there are limits to this, which you can find in our documentation. You can configure an alarm for any messages that are moved to the dead letter queue, examine logs for exceptions that might have caused the messages to be moved into the queue, analyze the contents of messages moved to the queue um, to diagnose software or producer or consumer hardware issues, and determine whether you've given your consumer enough time to process those messages. But the key here is there's no need for open heart surgery. You can inspect these messages outside the ha hassle of production and safely. We also have some new features that I'd like to point out within Amazon SQS. Our dead letter queue redrive uh, helps you efficiently redrive messages from your dead letter queue back into your source queue in the SQS console. It enables build builders to build applications um, with the confidence that they can examine their unconsumed messages, recover from errors in the console and reprocess their dead letter queues more easily. The next pattern I'd like to talk through is the asynchronous point to point model or router. Event routers need to decide where messages need to go. And in this example, we've got the blue channel and the green channel and blue and green messages. It's simple logic here in this example, but as you add more colors, more messages, uh, this can increase complexity, uh, increases uh, complexity in the logic and tighter coupling. Uh, and the sender maintains that routing logic and that, com that complexity with time. So how can we make this easier to manage? Here, we still have that sender and receiver, the green and blue, but we have an intermediary, a bus, to help route those messages around the right place. And I love the way that this has been named. I'm gonna be the first to say that uh, AWS sometimes has uh, confusing names for things, but I love the, the term of an event bus uh, and the service that I'm next gonna introduce, event bridge, to bridge that gap uh, for the event, event bus service. Event, Amazon Event Bridge is a simple, flexible, fully managed pay-as-you-go event bus service that makes it easy to ingest and process data from AWS services, your own applications and SaaS applications. It reduces location coupling and makes it efficient for senders and receivers. So let's have a look at how it works. Event, br event bridge connects applications using events. An event is a sing signal that a system state has changed. For example, a change in a customer support ticket. EventBridge allows you to ingest these events from AWS services already in your account, custom applications, or some of our SaaS providers. To write code to react to events, you need to know the event schema, which includes information such as title, format, and validation rules for each piece of data. The EventBridge schema registry stores a collection of easy to find schema, schema generated by your organization's applications, AWS services, or SaaS applications. You can also download code bindings for any schema into the registry in your IDE, which enables you to represent the event as a strongly typed object in your code. But regardless of the event source, the event lands, or which event bus, subscribers need to write rules against events, identifying which events are important to which subscriber. A rule matching incoming events and routes them to targets for processing. A single rule can route to multiple targets, all of which are processed in parallel. A target processes the events. Targets can include uh, many services, including Amazon EC2 instances, AWS Lambda functions, Amazon Kinesis streams, uh, ECS tasks, step function state machines, and more, some of which I'll go to later. And the target receives these in a JSON format. So we can use EventBridge to intelligently route events right to the downstream services asynchronously. The, down, the downstream service performs its task and moves on. And using EventBridge, we can easily filter events and send only to the downstream services that need that data. EventBridge is ingesting, filtering and delivering events without writing custom code. So you don't have to code those in the order service. This allows us to choreograph the flow of the events in the system and maintain boundaries between services. Relative to managing a monolith, it's sim simpler to in implement and a cleaner path. 
it's also easy to understand the flow of a system. There's over 28 services and uh, API destinations that you can connect to EventBridge. And with API destinations, you can uh, connect to HTTP requests to public endpoints through three authentication mechanisms. This can also help with throttling mechanisms within the API destinations. But taking a minor step back, I wanted to dive deeper into event-driven architectures and how some of the integration patterns I've already mentioned feed into uh, these designs. So to reiterate, an event is a, sing a signal that a system state has changed. And I always like to take these examples outside of tech. And one of my favorite examples that a colleague of mine gave at a recent workshop was a light switch. So imagine you come into a room and you turn that light switch on. That's an event. I can't unswitch the light switch, but when I leave the room, I can turn that light switch off, another event. This helps explain the concept that events cannot be changed or they are immutable. You can decrease coupling by restricting information to key data. Another example is the difference between directed commands and observable events. So here, uh, the manager is asking Joe to create an invoice and he says, okay, here it is. With observable events, you'll notice it, events occur in the past and we talk about them in this way to reflect this. So here, um, a person has said, customer X just ordered a widget and you'll have three separate responses. Some don't care, some is adding this to the, the invoice and others are creating a status report. Again, you'll notice that uh, the business events here are written in past tense. This is a convention to help reinforce that events are immutable and, and are in the past. Uh, however, it's not an obligation. But it all starts with these business events. And then we map these events to domains using attributes. So here we have a re retail fulfillment and support business domain. When we communicate between bounded business events, we call this choreography. This creates loose coupling between the communication of different domains. It's an important concept to remember that publishers of events cannot have an expectation of how and if that event will be processed by the subscriber. But publishers pull context from an event, adhere to that backwards compatible schema and successfully publish the event to an intermediary like an event bus. When there are expectations you're adding uh, tighter coupling to the model. So here we have that pub sub model again. Uh, the fulfillment uh, is, is subscribing to the retail saying notify me when an order is created. When an order is created, the uh, publisher sends that to the subscriber. So the retail business sends that to the fulfillment business. However, the publisher, the retail business, has no awareness of how it's processed in the fulfillment domain, but the retail domain still doesn't change. And you can imagine this, like when you go onto a website and you place your order and you get the confirmation that your order has been created, the business doesn't stop whilst waiting for you to receive your order. You can still make many more orders, uh, and, but there may be some working in the background. And so there are going to be cases when we need tighter coupling outside of this choreography and within a business domain. So on the screen now is, is further detail of what's going on within that retail domain to create that order created signal to send to the subscriber. So here within our microservice, we have uh, a consumer has placed an order on the website. Then we have a workflow, which is inside the pink box. Someone's checking if it's in stock, sends a notification to the invoice manager that it is in stock, creates that order, sends that back out to complete the workflow and notify the subscriber that an order has been created so that it can then pass through the business. Tightly coupled workflows or business events are called orchestration. Uh, and in a moment, I'll talk in a little bit more depth about AWS step functions and how that can help you orchestrate within your applications. But what we're seeing here is the model of a state machine. It describes a collection of computational steps split into discrete states. One, one starting state always 
and always one active state. The active state receives the input, takes some action and generates output. Transitions between states are based on state outputs and the rules that we define. Previously, organizing this was very expensive, but AWS Step Functions is our service to help you do this. Also, candidly, AWS Step Functions is my favorite service to talk about, um, so you can understand why I've spent some time here. AWS Step Functions is our ser serverless state machine. It enables more complex orchestration use cases across distributed workers. Its resilient workflow automation has built in error handling uh, and powerful AWS service integrations. And there are three key areas to consider. The workflows you build within step functions are called state machines, which I explained earlier. And each step of your state of your workflow is called a state. When you execute your state machine, each move from one state to the next is called a transition. And you can reuse components easily, edit the sequence of steps or swap out the code called by, by task states as your needs change. On the right hand side, you'll see um, a screen grab from our uh, AWS Step Functions Workflow Studio, which enables you to visualize uh, your workflow. So when you're creating workflows, uh, these are produced in domain specific language. Uh, AWS Step Functions state machines are defined in JSON using the declarative Amazon state language. Um, and you can create activity workers uh, applications running on EC2 instances or Lambda functions, for example, uh, with any program language, as long as you can communicate with AWS STEM functions using a web service API. For convenience, you may use uh, the AWS SDK language of your choosing, uh, particularly in the data science space, or our CDK to define workloads. Then this is visualized, uh, I, as I mentioned earlier in our Visual Workflow Studio, this can be really useful for design, but also for communicating workflows to various stakeholders across your organization. Customers are telling us time and time again that this is really powerful uh, for our service beyond uh, their design teams. Communicating to business stakeholders why you've decided to take decisions in, in your workflow or why one area of the business has decided to work in, in a way that others perhaps don't. Or, why, or sharing best practices across your organizations. And finally, execute and monitor. The execution of workflows is a horizontal execution of decision logic and each, each step of the workflow and integrations. Every step within an execution is ordered for you automatically uh, and, is, uh, and is sent to logging or a database if you're using the standard model. And there are two types uh, of integration types within AWS Step Functions. Optimized integration, which is customized to simplify the usage of 17 AWS services most commonly used with Step Functions, and some supported integration patterns I'll go to in a moment. And last year, the AWS Step Functions team uh, announced uh, SDK integrations, our software development kit, which allows API calls to over 200 AWS services directly, uh, which includes over 9,000 API actions. And these support two of the uh, <clears throat> patterns I'm gonna go through. So the different request patterns, the request response model, step functions will wait for a HTTP response and then progress to the next state. Step functions will not wait for a job to complete. The second is run a job, call a service and have step functions wait for a job to complete. And the last one, wait for a callback, call a service with a task token and have step functions wait until that token is returned with a payload. So the first one, um, you start with a synchronous response to an S3 bucket. Next, that response is sent to Lambda to process that request. Uh, in this case, a custom transformation. And then finally, an asynchronous request to EventBridge to get acknowledgement and complete the workflow. This is supported across all of the SDK, um, but whether it's an as uh, asynchronous or synchronous uh, for this integration depends on which service and SDK supports for that particular API call. Uh, the second uh, await for callback mechanism is an async, async mechanism for workers to report work, success, or failure. And here we're using a queuing mechanism to do this. 
So the first, we introduce a task token into messages going into an SQS queue, as well as other contexts needed for processing. A fleet of receivers, or in this case, one receiver, uh, processes the message uh, in case there's a problem. If there is a problem, it uses that task token to send a step function so that there's been an error. And the step function workflow catches that error and decides how to proceed. If successful, uh, it also sends the task success with that data back into your workflow for completion. It's, it's available in both optimized integrations and SDK integrations. And finally, run a job. Step functions is running a set of event-driven mechanisms to run asyncs jobs. In this case, we're integrating with our Amazon Athena, que Amazon Athena query service, a bit of a mouthful, to get results and publish our event. So we start off by doing a synchronous request to kick off a query job with Athena. Step functions will monitor this and when complete, send results back for the next step. It then collects those results uh, to get the data you need for your application. Once it's done, it sends an asynchronous request, much like the first pattern, to EventBridge to conclude as before. In this example, it's not supported under SDK integrations yet with this pattern, but you can find this under our optimized integrations. So to summarize, uh, events enable interaction between services, and hopefully today I've shown you some uh, general patterns to help you achieve this. There are four key services that I'd like you to take away and try out uh, after, after this day. Uh, Amazon Simple Queue Service being our messaging service for durable, scalable, fully managed and comprehensive security across your decoupling messaging mechanisms. Amazon EventBridge for choreography, event filtering, managing, managed and scalable and integrations uh, with your SaaS applications. Amazon uh, Simple Notification Service, SNS, for eventing uh, and published subscribe models for performance at scale, again, fully managed and enterprise ready. And my favorite AWS step functions uh, for orchestration within your microservices, sequence, sequencing uh, your workflows, parallel execution, state management and visualization for stakeholders across your organization. Now, just to summarize, Orchestration and, and choreography uh, go hand in hand together. With step functions, uh, you have one system that controls the flow between components. It's easier to do end-to-end -end monitoring, timeout, et cetera, and centralizes that business logic. You can use orchestration inside microservices or across different microservices if you need to distribute a transaction. With choreography, you coordinate different microservices, passing messages between bounded contexts of services or business contexts, as I showed earlier. The flow is an emergent property of events being sent, and it's easier to extend, modify, and build upon these messaging messages being passed. So to summarize, they're better together, and these things are often used together. We're getting really great feedback from our customers who are playing around with these services and pushing them into production. APIs and events that drive events and tightly coupled business processes put together with step functions and event bridge. More and more common that we're seeing this across microservices and modern applications. So decouple, think asynchronously, orchestrate and choreograph together. Thank you.